Now, looking at assessment, the first part of good assessment is good classroom communication and relationships with your students, knowing how they're going. You should have a good idea about how each of your students is progressing in their learning without needing to resort to formal assessment processes. Um, of course, we utilize formal assessment, but it all starts with good communication with your students. And there are some various approaches to achieving this. Um, so the first is active learning. This is where students aren't just listening to you and sitting passively, but they're actively involved in learning activities. Uh, could be through question and answering, could be through doing various activities, through doing programming tasks, um, database tasks, robotics tasks, but actively being involved in the learning process rather than just passively um, sitting there while you are actively teaching. So have a look at the concept of active learning and the various approaches that you can utilize to engage students actively with the learning process. Now there is the old um, uh, audiovisual methods in teaching pyramid where essentially it, it puts forward the idea that we remember 10% of what we uh, read, 20% um, of what we hear. So if we're just reading what's on the board or on a PowerPoint presentation, we'll retain about 10%. If someone's talking to us and explaining things to us, we'll retain about 20%. And if we can combine that with imagery and video and so forth, that may get up to 30%. Um, if we combine what we hear with what we see in a multimedia type process, that may increase to 50%. And according to this theory, um, what we then talk and explain to others, remember last week we looked at the process of um, working in pairs or speaking aloud in programming, but that will help us retain even more. And then the most effective is when we actually do things, when we actually utilize what we're learning and put it into practice. Now, there's an additional one beyond this, and this is where we retain even more or learn even more effectively when we have to teach someone else. And that's an increasing technique being used in schools where students teach one another or have a student teach you or teach a younger grades. But that process of having to teach someone else, as every teacher knows, is a very effective um, mechanism for learning new material. So the first concept around good classroom communications is actually having students doing things rather than you just talking at them. Next is positive reinforcement. Now we've talked about behaviorism as a um, uh, teaching process and receiving positive reinforcement releases endorphins. It makes us more in, engaged with the learning process in a positive way, which helps reinforce memory formation and it's just an all-round good thing to do. Um, what has been shown as the worst possible case is when students are fearing, feeling fearful or distressed, where you're angry at them or you're trying to force them to do things. Um, and that's the worst environment in which to be learning. So setting up a positive learning environment, providing positive reinforcement for students when they're doing things effectively and appropriately, and when their learning is uh, progressing is a very important part of classroom communication. So you should always be going around your, to your students and recognizing when they're doing things well and giving them that praise. You'd be surprised at just how effective that is as a technique. Um, young children, particularly in their relationships with um, I won't say authority figures, but figures that they respect and they want your respect, they want your approval. So 
doing things that receive that approval will reinforce that behavior and they'll be more likely to continue in that vein. Giving clear and concise instructions is a very important process. Um, part of that being a safe, conducive learning environment is students feeling comfortable with what's occurring, knowing what is happening, knowing what is expected of them and what they need to do in order to meet various expectations, including their own expectations for their own performance. If they're unsure about what's happening, if it's a disruptive, uncertain environment, that is not going to be conducive to learning. And it'll be difficult for you to understand where they're at because the environment itself is chaotic. So having clear, concise rules and expectations set out that everyone understands and is comfortable with. Now, part of that can also be to allow students to take a part in setting those rules because that then reinforces what the rules are but it also gives them buy into those rules and then they're more likely to actually adhere to them and engage with them. Then we get to questioning. Now questioning is a time-honored technique in um, teaching and there's a whole range of different processes around questioning. Um, making sure you don't show too much bias in your questioning. There'll always be some, but trying to set things up so that you don't always ask the same students um, to answer questions all of the time or have only certain students volunteer to respond all of the time. So you can randomize things, you can call on students directly. There's a whole range of techniques around questioning, but one of the most effective techniques is open-ended questions. So not just asking for a response that might be yes or no or a set um, answer, but asking questions that can then be extended so it may be, um, how did you go about creating that solution to the problem? Rather than, did you do this to solve that problem? And then you can do what's called redirect. So um, before you confirm whether or not that's a correct answer or not, redirect it to another student. Do you agree with that? Do you think that that is the correct approach that um, should be done? And you can actually bounce that around several times to engage more students. So there's various approaches around um, Q&A questioning that you should be exploring in terms of getting good classroom communication going and having a good understanding of what your students are at and how their learning is progressing. Now, another technique is nonverbal communication. Um, use of your hand gestures, uh, use of facial gestures, uh, frowns and smiles and um, positive reinforcement processes, but also negative. Um, I was horrified to learn from my students that uh, my sighs were um, considered one of the most hor horrifying experiences that they had. Um, if they were trying to solve problems and positively trying to uh, seek my approval in doing um, tasks correctly, and I sighed in not so much it wasn't disappointment, but that's how they often interpreted it. Um, that was something that they disliked in the classroom environment. So your nonverbal communications, or in that case, semi-verbal, are important. Your students will pick up on everything that you do. It's horrifying how much they pick up on. Um, where you look, how you look, um, how you respond to um, questions, you need to think about um, the way you present yourself to your students because they will pick up on all of those tiny cues and talk to them about it. You're not going to be able to understand most of those cues, but your students definitely will. They're watching you intently. So discuss with them about the messages that you're sending and how that could be improved in terms of improving your communication with them. And this leads in then to active listening actually listening to your students. Um, unfortunately, some teachers don't do this very well at all. They might ask some questions and get the responses they want, but they're not necessarily um, authentically interested in what the students are saying. But actively seek the advice of your students. 
actively seek what they are thinking about and what they want to have happen in the classroom. It's not just your classroom, it's theirs. They should have an authentic voice and be able to actually express their ideas if it is an open, supportive um, learning environment. If it's an environment that you control everything and the only voice that matters in the room is yours, they're not going to be um, conducive to learning and to sharing information in, in an open and honest way with you. So you need to practice active listening. And one of the most important aspects of that is you not talking, um, allowing your students to talk and then allowing another student to talk before you respond. And as much as possible, letting your students do the talking, not you do the talking. Um, so the whole range of aspects around active listening, and you can read about some of those in the notes here. But sometimes you will be expected to do some talking, and paraphrasing is one of the methods that you can utilise, where you reword various um, explanations in different ways so that students can pick up on different aspects of what they're learning. Sometimes when you explain something, some of the students will get it, some won't. You need to be able to pick up on that and then reword what you've said in different ways. And part of that, of course, is Q&Aing to identify that um, the message hasn't gotten through. Um, and then you need to think about how you can restructure your explanation for different students for their needs in terms of their learning. And then finally, there's what's called metacommunication. Particularly for your older students, this is where they are actually learning about the process of assessment. In fact, they're very interested in assessment, probably more so than you may be. Um, but also, they're interested in the whole classroom dynamics. They may not always express that, but they are. This is their space as much as it is yours. So one of the most one of the measures of greater success for students are those that actually master what is occurring in a classroom environment and in particularly what's occurring around assessment. Some of your students just don't care about assessment. It's not something they're particularly interested in, so they don't obviously do particularly well on it. There are other students though that are interested in those processes and pick up on what is successful, what's not, game the system, for want of a better word. But they also start thinking about their own processes of communication and how they interact with you. So teaching your students how to communicate well, how to listen well, how to engage with unpacking information and repurposing, how to ask good questions, how to listen and, um, and accept that others can provide responses rather than just have um, themselves talk, particularly when they're in a group dynamic situation. So there's a whole set of skills that you need to be ensuring your students have so that they can be more effective in their learning. So all of this is to do with communication and it's a big part of assessment because it's the mechanism you have for gaining an understanding of your students' learning.